Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I want to let you guys know about another great Mises event we have coming up on November 4th in Fort Myers, Florida. As you know, everyday Americans feel the political capture of the economy. Inflation, taxes, and regulatory costs hit our paychecks and our savings. The regulatory capture of the medical industries, food and energy production, and the various instruments of big tech empower the regime with new tools to promote their latest ideological cause. The ever-growing burden of government debt has become a crisis without any political will to address it. We're going to be talking about these very issues at this event in Fort Myers. And best of all, we have a discount code for Radio Rothbard listeners. If you use promo code RR2023, RR as in Radio Rothbard, 2023, you'll get $10 off at this event. If you want to learn more, visit Mises.org slash FL2023. FL is in Florida. Look forward to seeing you there. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, is my co-host, Tho Bishop, here at the Mises Institute. And it's, uh, it's our fall funding drive here at the Mises Institute this week. And uh, so if you haven't, make sure and go to M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. Click on the donate button and become a member of the Mises Institute for five bucks a month, $60 per year. And you'll then get uh, free physical copies of the Austrian and a variety of other benefits, and you'll just be f- forevermore uh, connected to the Mises Institute, where you'll be getting a nice array of books, free research, great articles online, and of course, Radio Rothbard. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some issues that are core uh, to the Mises Institute and what we're all about and why we exist and the importance of our work. Uh, by addressing the issue of the classical liberals. And what does that mean? What does the term mean? Is this a term we should use? And are they different from the libertarians? Now, here at the Mises Institute, of course, we're very closely associated with the Austrian School of Economics. Now, that's a particular school of economics. It's not really an ideology. However, we are part of this ideology that most people would call libertarian. But what does that have to do with the classical liberals, which are often mentioned uh, along similar lines? We, we know vaguely what this means. It generally means more or less free market. Maybe it's guys in three cornered hats. Maybe George Washington was a classical liberal, something like that. Uh, why do people use the term? Um, let's just talk about that a little bit today. I think we'll have to come back to the issue in the future because there's so many issues that could be uh, discussed around it. Um, But what is the difference between libertarians and classical liberals? Um, There isn't a difference. I think this is a point we've tried to make often uh, on Mises.org, is that the term liberal refers to this ideology that came out of the 17th century and just generally means It's a group of people who believe in free markets and that society can generally run itself without intervention from the state. That's that's what it means. Now, the term was then co-opted in the 1930s by a bunch of social Democrats uh, who wanted to capitalize on the popularity of the term, because throughout the early 20th century, most of the 19th century, liberals were the most popular political movement especially among the middle classes. So ever since really even beginning in the late 19th century, other groups who had no particular love of freedom or free markets started trying to co-opt the term. And they succeeded mightily in the 1930s by deciding that uh, basically people we would call social Democrats, people who believe in lots of government intervention were the real liberals. And so they just stole the term and renamed themselves that. And now you've got even people who claim to be for freedom and free markets using that term all the time. They've given away the term, uh, classical liberal. Now I've noted also some attempts in even the more say conservative or libertarian press to now co-opt the term classical liberal to not even mean libertarian. 
uh, with even the classical modifier opposed uh, or attached to the the beginning of it. Because most people know that that longer term means, oh, well, we're referring to those older guys from the 19th century, you know, like uh, Adam Smith. Those guys are classical liberals. And sure, they were free market. That's something else. But now we're being told, oh, well, these these modern day libertarian guys, they're too radical. That classical liberal means much more moderate. It's like uh, it's Alexander Hamilton. And I've started to see this now popping up in a variety of publications, people trying to uh, change the meaning of that term to triangulate out of it libertarians and and basically say that conservatives have the real claim modern day conservatives have the real claim to the whole classical liberal thing so apparently everybody wants to use the term to label it themselves one way or the other and i mean have you seen some examples of this though uh in the media i mean how is this term used nowadays has there been any uh <laughs> any progress made on this or is it, is it still uh, modern day left wingers are called liberals and then uh, people are still fighting over classical liberal and what exactly that means. Well, most often I see the term classical liberal kind of used to promote a sort of reason centralism. You know, I don't want to be affiliated with those crazy people on the right. Uh, I'm not a socialist and I might speak out against woke causes or critical race theory. Uh, James Lindsay um, comes to mind uh, there. And so it's kind of, I think, more, most often used as sort of a, a you know, the, the respectable, moderate centrist that, yes, we recognize that markets work better than not. Yes, we recognize that um, the left has gone far too crazy on some of the most progressive cultural issues. But, you know, we are the bastion of you know, rational secularism, right, which is often, I think, kind of a, a major part um, often with sort of the, the framing there, right? You know, a, a, a rejection of all antiquated sort of ties to, um, you know, to, to, to nation, to religion, to family and the like. And, you know, you have this broader sort of appeal to universally held values. Um, and, and this, this goes into, um, Paul Godfrey made this criticism of what liberalism had become. He, he identified sort of modern classical liberalism. I know it's a clunky term as kind of arising from the death of the more radical, uh, property as the foundation of society dynamic of, you know, a Louis von Mises. Um, and that, you know, it's this appeal to universally held values, this appeal to this sort of notion of tolerance and niceness that is then reconciled through a democratic process and a marketplace of ideas. And that this has kind of largely become the liberal project of the 20th century. Um, from a philosophical perspective, not necessarily, you know, obviously the, the political project of liberalism in the modern sense can, you know, look all sorts of different ways, you know, FDR's America and to the Obama era, you know, depending on how you want to interpret it. But I think that is typically the way in intellectual circles that we see this sort of elevated. And, you know, you had circumstances like the, the Adam Smith Institute in the UK that particularly within the um, debates over uh, Brexit and the like. You know, they're trying to distance themselves from that sort of libertarian label that became, I think, more synonymous with Ron Paul in particular after 2008 and 2012. Um, I know, obviously, you know, we kind of have this this interesting dynamic in the U.S. where you know there's tension between you know is a libertarian represented by Reason Magazine or the Cato Institute versus you know, sort of the, the Auburn brand of libertarianism, um, if you will. Um, but I think internationally, right, you know, Ron Paul as a kind of a standard bearer of libertarianism within American politics also led to other scholars outside the US um, that have, you know, they have, I think, as well, this sort of uh, very crude uh, version of F.A. Hayek that they kind of use as an icon to it. Like they, they kind of want to, you know, they, they kind of make him out to be, you know, sort of bastion of, of, 
uh, you know, reasonable moderation, right, as, as relative to, to, to old man Mises, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a term that I think is often sort of used as a means of, of distancing yourself from left or right from the libertarian world. And so it, as a definition, I think has lost a lot of value. And I, I know from my own perspective in dealing with, um, you know, thinkers on the right trying to navigate the sort of current political environment, um, you know, trying to, you know, as myself, as someone who has become a lot more interested in history, a lot more interested in Christianity and the like, um, you know, you see a lot of attacks on by, by you know, people who I otherwise respect in intellectual right wing circles that have also sort of made classical liberalism as synonymous with um, kind of enlightenment atheism. And so there, there's some critiques there, which, again, if you actually you know, look back at what the radical classical liberals you know, actually thought, um, you know, many of them, you know, you know, it, it was not some sort of rabid movement of you know, godless heathens challenging all norms and you know, embracing sort of a French revolutionary sort of perspective on reason. Um, you, you find a lot more nuance. And as someone who, and as, as we've talked in the past about um, you know, someone who's very interested in Jacksonian politics. Um, you know, in many ways, Jacksonian politics represents political classical liberalism um, in one of its best historical eras as well. well. And so I, I'm, I think this is a very interesting conversation to have, given that there's so much, I think, confusion out there around the term. Yeah, well, it's safe to say that people are still fighting over the term. People still want to use those terms. I mean, why use the term liberal at all, right, unless it still had some kind of important value? And both the left and the right try to use the term. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people on the right, they're, they're using the word incorrectly. They're trying to, and they're trying to distance themselves from an imagined uh, anti-religious sort of uh, social agenda-driven form of liberalism. Uh, that they imagine is is what really defines liberalism. And there's a problem with that historical interpretation. And let's talk about that a little bit. I'm going to be drawing a lot on the work of our uh, the late, great Ralph Rako, our former senior fellow here at the Mises Institute who died a few years ago. Uh, he has, if you haven't seen it, a 10-lecture series on Mises.org. Uh, on the history of liberty, and he talks a lot about, all right, where do our definitions of these terms come from, and what is the proper historical view of what liberalism is and what it represents? And again, the the liberal tradition from the 17th century up until now really has always been the libertarian tradition. It is a generally an, a very laissez-faire, an anti-war ideology and also generally an ideology that's extremely skeptical of state power. Um, and there have been some gray areas to just how radical that is, uh, but there have been some huge misinterpretations about its social agenda. And Ralph points out that the story that most English-speaking students of the history of political thought in general, and you, you'll encounter this in any introductory political science class if you go through that as an undergraduate, um, or you may be required to take uh, some sort of politics class, uh, even if you were majoring in something else uh, as part of your undergraduate program. And what you're taught is very similar. And people, they accept this, and they clearly still believe it to this day. What the reader, you'll be given like a reader that has like a bunch of writings about politics in it, and, you'll, and there will be a section on liberalism. And they mean generally historical liberalism, or at least will include that in that section. And what they'll tell you is that the primary representative of 19th century liberalism is a man named John Stuart Mill. And you'll talk to PhDs, and their whole idea then of the free market, pro-freedom, uh, liberal world is best encapsulated by Mill. And Mill, however, was not actually representative of the larger liberal tradition. And he had a lot of weird deviations, actually, and Reiko points all these out. Mill was not particularly good on foreign policy. He tended to support, he tended to support imperialism. Uh, Mill, who made his living, by the way, as a government bureaucrat for the East India Company, so certainly didn't live the, the free market life. Um, he also was bad on free trade. 
And he turned liberalism into this weird crusade for self-expression, which was his own personal project. Uh, because Mill uh, was carrying on with a married woman and he had all of these, these personal issues uh, with the prevailing morality of the day, he, he became obsessed with this issue of undermining all the, the dominant social pressures that might be brought to bear upon people in ordinary life. Now, social pressures that are brought to bear on you by your peers and whatever people's religious feelings are, none of that had anything to do with the larger liberal project that most liberals were concerned about government coercion. They were concerned about taxation. They were concerned about government monopolies, uh, such as the East India Company. They were concerned about uh, meddling by the state in your everyday life. They didn't consider, oh, well, people disapprove of your daily habits as having anything to do with liberal ideology. But Mill managed to turn it into that, how this idea of the, the primary value of liberalism is, uh, is maybe tolerance or maybe it's self-expression or maybe it's breaking free of, of social uh, pressures from, from anywhere outside and that we, we need to redefine society and revolutionize society to become something else entirely. That's part of the Millian project. And what people have done is then take what Mill was in favor of and say, oh, this is liberalism. And if you can get break beyond just that one little faction of English speaking liberalism and you go into the larger issue, which is far better represented by people like Richard Cobden, who led the incredibly successful uh, uh, move against the, uh, the taxes on food. It was called the Anti-Corn Law League in the 19th century. That was more representative of liberalism than anything Mill was doing, but all students have been taught this fake version of liberalism that now everybody thinks, oh yes, well, liberalism, it's really about this social agenda, and that's why I, as a religious conservative, cannot believe in it, or why it's actually the precursor of 20th century liberalism. And it's just it's just a completely incorrect interpretation. And But that's what's been handed down, at least in the English-speaking world, and we're still dealing with that problem to today. So now, even now, when you have people thinking about, oh, what, what are the progenitors of modern liberalism or where does libertarianism come from? You'd be amazed at the number of people who think it's about these social ideas when really the core of it has always been about things like taxation and limiting government power. And I think that this kind of goes to the point of like, why does this conversation really matter? And it's not so much that we're going out there and, and tell you that, you know, you know, you need to make calling yourself a classical liberal, you know, part of your identity, right, or anything like that. But it's, it's important understanding the history of this tradition to understand what exactly is, is being pulled from, right? There is value to come from reading the works of people living hundreds of years ago. There is a richness to this tradition. And one of the things I find really fascinating is that, you know, given, um, you know, this sort of age right now of, of populism, this age right now of, uh, decentralization um, increasing, you know, as, as an increasingly interesting political dynamic, right? You know, Brexit being an example, but really a lot of what is mot uh, motivating the right um, ac you know, uh, across geographical borders, right? You know, it is a, a desire in America to secede from, you know, the deep state of Washington, right? It is the desire to break away from the EU, uh, often within Europe, it might be a desire to break from the, you know, sort of, you know, global homo Western sort of projection, trying to, to project our, our, our values upon the rest of the world through foreign policy and economic affairs to homogenize sort of the cultural con uh, foundations out there. There is, I think, a, a major aspect of where the middle, the modern American right is motivated, mobilized by what really comes down to a desire for self-determination. And you know, self-determination, na you know, nationalism in a, in a liberal sense, right? You know, not uh, uh, you know, militarant uh, you know, jingoism or something like that, but the, the desire to break away from foreign rules so that your people can be governed by common values and common language as a point of emphasis of Mises, right? These all ground themselves within very much that, that classical liberal tradition. Um, it's kind of interesting. Hungary, 
um, with, with Viktor Orban, who has positioned himself right as as the political leader against liberalism. Um, and, and I'm not trying to scapegoat him. I, I understand that he is kind of responding to modern liberalism. But Hungary, uh, the, the history of Hungary itself, right? It, it, it was an example of liberal nationalism uh, separating itself from the rule of the Habsburgs. And so, you know, there is, I think, a, you know, a lot of what is kind of dismissed out there, you know, this kind of wraps itself into broad, you know, dismissals of libertarianism, you know, as sort of this, this Lalbert philosophy, which, you know, I'm sure most listeners are, you know, experience and in online disputes on, on almost a daily basis right now, there is something much deeper here um, that should not be thrown away. Um, and that this is not simply a, an understanding of the importance of, of economics, which itself would be something worth defending, but there is something that classical liberalism has to say against the real political pressures of our time. And you know, this is something that there's, this is a very proud tradition. And you know, this is why the, the work of, of people like Ralph Rako, um, you know, really expanding upon and correcting a lot of the distortions that this sort of 20th century revision you know, we're, we're still kind of still attached on. There's still that stink sort of attached to the label is worth addressing. And let's look at if, if someone was to say, OK, well, what is the proper interpretation of the history of liberalism? We've identified that we're taught a bogus version of it by being told that Mill was a great liberal. Sometimes that even uh, goes on to uh, tell us that the natural progression then went from Adam Smith through John Stuart Mill, and then was basically completed with John Maynard Keynes, who, of course, was no liberal either. Uh, so that's also another terrible interpretation that we get. I mean, <laughs> Keynes praised the Soviet communists under Stalin uh, in, in the 1930s and uh, thought communism was fine because for Keynes, the heart of, of good progressive ideology was experimenting with new projects and, and trying to undo uh, all of this dogmatic free market stuff of the past. I have no idea how people are told that uh, that's, that guy was a liberal, but you'll hear that all the time, that Keynes was a liberal. Other, other sorts of nonsense we hear about liberalism is that maybe Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a liberal. Uh, also laughable nonsense. I don't know how anybody comes up with that one. Sometimes Voltaire is said to be a liberal, which he clearly was not. Uh, sometimes Voltaire is said to be a liberal simply because he was an anti-clericalist. So he hated uh, the Catholic Church. So in the minds of some people, that makes you a liberal, which uh, the, the reality is way more complex than that. Uh, and so equating liberalism to anti-clericalism, uh, completely wrong. Uh, we can point to a wide variety of 19th century French liberals who could disabuse anyone of that. So who should we be reading then? Uh, well, <laughs> whenever you bring up Adam Smith in our circles, of course, uh, people who are uh, who have read a lot of Rothbard, uh, they will mention that Rothbard was not a huge fan of Adam Smith. So is Adam Smith the key liberal here uh, from that period? Well, obviously it's not Smith, because if we want to go back and understand Jefferson's ideology, we have to go back to Jean. Lock. Uh, and so really, the proper interpretation of libertarianism slash liberalism, uh, we cannot make a distinction between the two in any way at that point, was clearly with the levelers, with the Civil War in England, with these people who started phrasing matters as natural rights, rights to life, liberty, and property, which Locke gave voice to. And that filtered down to 100 years later, Thomas Jefferson, and now we see it in the Declaration of Independence. So clearly, these were, these were radical revolutionaries, the levelers. Uh, they're sometimes denounced today by conservatives who would have us believe these people were some sort of like ultra egalitarian communist types, mixing them in with a group that was called the Diggers back then. Now, the Diggers were legit commies, uh, but had very little to do uh, with the levelers. And in fact, the levelers were often uh, criticized by leftists then and now as being excessively bourgeois and middle class because they liked private property too much. So really, if you want to understand liberalism, you got to go all the way back to the 1600s. You got to look at Locke. You got to look at the levelers who had extremely similar ideology to Locke because that feeds right into Jefferson, who was obviously a liberal. And if he were living today, would obviously be called a libertarian. So, okay, well, what about those guys? What about Smith then? Well, 
Rothbard, not a big fan. So in our circles, they say, well, maybe Smith wasn't a great liberal. Well, Rothbard didn't love Smith's economics. And I think the main reason he criticized Smith was because he thought Smith was vastly overrated. Not that Smith was necessarily a bad economist in most ways. He was bad about the, um, the labor theory of value. But his reputation was just so immense that it made Rothbard kind of really sort of hold his nose a little bit and think, okay, we got to bring this guy down a peg. Uh, but Rako would tell you it's okay to like Adam Smith because Smith's social policy was very influential on the continent and pushed a lot of people toward in the direction of liberalism in the late 18th and early 19th century. So there are reasons to like Smith. But Smith, even we couldn't say, is on the continent at least the most influential guy. Uh, who should we point to there? I think we would have to talk about guys that you've probably never heard of because they wrote in French. And in America, we, we can't consider anyone important who didn't write in English. But in reality, if we're concerned about where did Austrian economics come from, where did Ludwig von Mises get his thinking, it wasn't from the British tradition. He got it from the continental tradition. So we're talking about guys like Benjamin Constant, who is widely regarded as really the most important liberal of the late 18th and early 19th century. We've got uh, Frederick Bastiat, who certainly our readers will be familiar with as the, as the writer of The Law. Jean-Baptiste Say was immensely influential in the 19th century. And then they start to really take a hardcore anarchist turn with guys like Charles Comte, and who you've probably never heard of, but who founded a very important journal that then later influenced Gustave de Molinari, who was a hardcore secessionist. He edited a very important journal in Europe for 30 years uh, and was extremely influential on two generations of libertarians slash liberals. And from there, it filtered out throughout Western Europe, into Germany, into Italy, into Austria. And to the extent that free markets prevailed anywhere, to the extent that taxes were held down for ideological reasons, we have those guys to credit for it. Certainly not John Stuart Mill. So the, the real progression of all of this needs to be traced really through the continent, through the French, because of course, uh, Jefferson also admired very much a lot of that. And that was the hardcore stuff. That was the stuff where we get Mises uh, and, and his more hardcore ideology. It's where Rothbard got most of his thought. And so the people who are the real standard bearers of real free market libertarianism today, they're just reflecting the views of 19th century uh, liber liberals on the continent. I mean, th this, is, this is a direct line from those hardcore secessionist revolutionaries in the 17th century straight up through Ludwig von Mises and to Murray Rothbard. And that's... So I would say that it's really the, the libertarians of the Mises Institute type and kind who are carrying on that real tradition. Everything else is watered down. Everything else is, uh, is two million has embraced some sort of weird social agenda that the British maybe came up with later. And that I would suggest that people who think that that's the real line of liberalism through that British guys who think liberalism is all about uh, whatever your sexual preferences or something, uh, that's just a made up incorrect version of things. And I would definitely encourage you uh, to look at much more detail at the real history of liberalism uh, that I've just described. And you'll find a lot of that on Mises.org, uh, where, by the way, you should go this week and click on the donate button and give money for our autumn uh, funding drive. Uh, so, but though, I mean, wh what do you think the prospects are for this? I mean, just how much work do we have cut out for us and try to rewrite this history of liberalism? Well, I, I do think it's, it's an uphill battle uh, in, in many ways. I think the, the label itself is, is even a harder sell right now than the, the battle over the word um, libertarian uh, in, in many ways, just because you've got kind of, a, I think it definitely, it, it's, it has become, I think, even trendier um, these days to kind of wrap yourself as, as again, almost as a, as a meaningless word here. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile in pursuing these intellectuals and of taking pride in the tradition. Um, and again, I, I know there's a lot of, you know, a lot of pressure out there to, um, there's, I think the, you know, we, we have um, at the same time within certain intellectual circles right now, 
a uh, revisionist look at the Enlightenment um, in general as a period of history um, with a lot more um, uh, negative sort of viewpoints of it. One, uh, one great example of this um, talk that I very much enjoyed um, was uh, by uh, Daniel Jamian, um, who talked about the costs of the Enlightenment. And what you have is, I think, a broader criticism of, again, the, the triumph of reason over religion, you know, reason, you know, uh, the, the establishment that all bonds that matter should entirely be voluntary, that you have um, you know, no level of duty to family, to fellow, fellow countrymen, um, you know, that, that all ties can be kind of dictated by your own whims. And this is a, an element that has also played itself out throughout libertarianism. Um, you know, you, you can see this uh, within you know, objectivist circles. You can see this with um, you know, Stefan Molyneux and his views on um, you know, leaving your family um, in, in a more contemporary sphere. Um, but again, if, if you actually read a lot of the social and cultural thought from these classical liberal thinkers, um, you, you see a lot of, you know, you, you don't see a, again, a, an entire you know, closet full of atheists. You see people that have a, a tremendous respect for Christianity and the role that it played in creating a culture of respect for the individual. Um, you know, you, you see uh, Cato's letters, um, which was a, a very meaningful and impactful um, you know, popularizer of liberal ideas, more read in pre-revolutionary America than John Locke. Um, obviously, Rothbard had a, a lot of respect for, for Locke's work, but Locke's um, views on religion have been criticized a bit within the modern right um, for sort of maintaining a viewpoint of uh, religious neutrality in terms of power. Um, and I, I think there are some, some reasonable arguments to be made that you know, there's always a, an element of moral value that guides power that exists, um, you know, which is why we would favor making, the, you know, you know, making those decisions at the most local level as possible. It kind of goes into you know, you know, taking it to its, its fullest extent and kind of get hoppy in covenant community sort of territory there. Um, but Cato's letters um, you know, had very different views on some of these topics because they respected the fact that uh, you know, if you had a power structure in place that did not share the common religious values that they enjoyed as you know, you know, proud British citizens, that itself would lead to its own form of tyranny. And this dynamic of being a minority class within a broad interventionist government also is, is a major component of Mises' works on uh, liberalism, where one of the reasons why he you know, advocates for secession in a very radical, um, you know, d down to the individual level, if at all possible, is because he recognizes that so long as the state exists, and as so long, particularly if it is very interventionist in nature, if you are of a different value system, if you are a, of a different ethnicity, if you're of a different uh, religion or, or language, that it is very natural to be, feel like a second-class citizen if you have a government that is not restrained to the liberal vision of a respect for property rights. So these are, are not individuals that have a complete, you know, that, that want to kind of wash away and ignore these fundamental cultural dynamics of the importance of religion, the importance of common history, the importance of familiar bonds, they, they do not ignore it to, perf to, to kind of, you know, it, it promote some sort of unrealistic, atomized human society. These are thinkers that have given these very important topics a great deal of respect. And so, you know, you, you can, I think, distinguish classical liberalism away from sort of a, a left enlightenment perspective generally um, with a respect that they is is here for you know various aspects of what well, we might consider traditional values, and I I, I think that it makes this topic a, a very engaging one, a very interesting one, um, given the sort of discourse out there, and uh, that's why I'm 
enjoyed going down this rabbit hole, you know, re-engaging with the works of, of Ralph Rako in particular, and you know, exploring uh, the views of Benjamin Constant, which we had a conversation off air earlier on. Um, because again, there's, there's an incredible amount of wisdom within this tradition. And if you are interested in supporting more scholarship building off of these traditions, uh, <laughs> not only can you go to Mises.org and make a donation, but we actually have a special Radio Rothbard link at Mises.org slash RR5. And if you give a $5 recurring donation there, you'll get a copy of a, a, a Rothbard mini book on uh, 10 great economic myths, which I know any Radio Rothbard listener would love to add to their personal collection. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the Enlightenment a little bit. I think that's what, a lot, what muddies the waters a lot. Um, the Enlightenment uh, is, of course, obviously that's a propaganda name for this movement, right? Oh, we'll just call ourselves the Enlightenment. Who's, who's against Enlightenment? Uh, just how the Renaissance was for a long time called the Renaissance. By the way, serious historians don't call it the Renaissance anymore. They call it the early modern period, which is a better name for it because there was no rebirth of something. You know, it was guys like Machiavelli and all of that who actually represent the Renaissance, uh, hardcore authoritarians, people in favor of absolutism. I'm not sure how this period came to be associated with liberalism in some way. Uh, the the so-called Enlightenment and Renaissance were actually steps backward in terms of human freedom. Uh, but they're, uh, they're, they've been very effective at uh, promoting themselves, uh, the, the, the early theorists of it and those who still support them to this day. But uh, the, the obsession with reason among the Enlightenment people, a lot of people I know still associated with liberalism. In fact, we got uh, a article submission here at Mises.org not too long ago, and it was one of those more philosophical pieces. And in it, uh, the author says that uh, one of the chief characteristics of liberalism is its total reliance on human reason. Um, well, that's that's completely untrue. That's historically untrue that the liberals had some sort of to total reliance on human reason or even discussed it on a uh, regular basis. Most, the overwhelming majority of liberals and the people who are out in the world as activists and writers, um, except for a very small number of very highfalutin philosophers, the sorts of people that uh, college professors like to read today but had very limited actual influence in uh, actual liberal movements were they had they were usually religious they didn't go on and on all day about reason what they went on about was human natural rights and the the necessity of having the regime respect those rights and that property rights were important and that people need free speech and all that sort of stuff there was generally a practical ideology and unfortunately, college professors are the people who teach this sort of thing, and they also tend to become uh, very interested in the highest high-level theorists who are, may or may not have anything to do with the actual playing out of liberal ideas uh, in the real world. So they're quoting guys like Rousseau um, or uh, just Mill all day long. And when Mill writes something about how uh, Catholic priests um, are all slaves of their religious orders and thus have no freedom, uh, and this is, a, this is a reason why any sort of true devotion to freedom must abolish religion entirely, that's, that's just one of Mill's crackpot theories that had basically no British liberal movement uh, considered that to be particularly important in the 19th century. They considered they were... Uh, interested in things like poverty and taxes and the actual freedom to open a business. So it's just, we, we need to look at what the reality is of liberalism and that when you, st when you have philosophers telling all the stories about the history of these movements, we need to be able to maybe dig a little deeper than that and see that, oh, well, maybe what these people said about the Enlightenment actually had nothing to do with what the majority of liberals actually believed. So we need to also really make important distinctions between 18th century fl French Enlightenment stuff and 19th century liberalism. It, one does not lead to the other, but the way it's taught in schools is all just kind of this, this thing that occupies uh, the same space in people's heads and it all gets jumbled up and just the, the, the education that is given on the history of the movement is terrible. If you want to understand what uh, late 18th and early 19th century liberalism was all about, just look at modern day libertarians. I mean, 
that that is really all of that stuff you consider to be so radical and over the top in terms of secession and getting rid of government intervention. That was all just regular old generic liberalism in, say, the 1830s. Uh, and that's what everybody recognized it as. Uh, people weren't going on and on about human reason and that sort of thing that just didn't pl play a central part in it at all. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of work we have to do, and I think starting to uh, try to get people to understand what the realities were. Well, in some of that, you know, we can see it play out with the American experiment, where again, if you look at you know, what was the motivating factors within um, Jacksonian the Jacksonian movement, right? Yeah, you, you, with America, you never had, um, you never had that clear class distinction, right, between the landed class and, and the peasant class, right? You didn't have a sort of hereditary aristocracy, um, you know, which was obviously a major you know, uh, a driver in a lot of, of the, you know, the political conversations within Europe. But within the Jacksonian tradition, right, it was going after the state privileges granted to special interest groups, right? So it was going after the Bank of the United States, because they saw it as a driver of corruption that allowed for certain, you know, privileged, politically connected individuals to benefit at the expense of the rest of the population. It was eliminating, um, you know, allowing for average people to seek corporations, uh, to, to, to create their own corporations for their business, rather than it being a very selective privilege granted, again, by the political favored class. So it, it was a, a leveling effect where economic rights were not dedicated based off of your connection to, you know, whoever was the, the governor at the time, um, but rather helped inspire, uh, you know, this, this culture, this, 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 you know, the, the American dynamic that, um, of, of meritocracy, of, you know, self-improvement of, you know, being able to amass wealth that could, you could then leave your children to, you know, kind of grow a, a strong family tradition and the like, you know, these were the front lines of political liberalism within the American experience. And so, again, these are precisely, you know, what, you know, those people were being inspired directly by this, this classical liberal tradition. And I think that, you know, again, if we, if you look out and abroad, with the modern conversations today, right? You know, we we have this this financial class that you know is able to, that has been you know able to take advantage of political connections and you know, the benefit from Cantillon effects and the like to elevate themselves and then project their values right onto America. Some of these conflicts that are driving you know the populist right and, and some of the the criticism that the the, the very core of the argument of a lot of these thinkers um, or, or political activists or however you want to describe this class today, often those people that are the most uh, uh, negative on libertarians or classical liberals or this entire tradition, ultimately their critiques of the current system um, you know, are solved by liberal solutions within the tradition. And so this is why it is, it is a, a battle that is worth continuing to fight because the idea that, oh, well, the solution is to simply replace, you know, a progressive king, you know, with a conservative, you know, trad king, and that's going to solve all these problems. Well, no, like, you know, we, 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 we've seen, you know, that is, that is, that is not how solution, uh, history shows. This is, you know, typically does not end the way that you think it's going to end. Um, you know, liberalism creates a, a viable path where, again, it leads, it, it requires more responsibility on the citizenry, right? So you need, need to have a citizenry that, that is willing to, that is capable and, and willing to take up the self-governing mechanisms that a liberal society must have, um, you know, but that is ultimately what is necessary to live in good communities. You need to have you know, neighbors that you can trust. You need to have uh, neighbors that want a, a better future for themselves, right? You know, these, these are inherent dynamics um, that again, cannot be imposed, you know, arbitrarily or, or through the fiat of the state. Yeah, we should note that liberalism grew out of uh, opposition to absolutism. So absolutism, which was something that really began to take shape in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, and it was ba based on this idea of mercantilism, which was its, its economic doctrine that the government should own major corporations and should really dominate the marketplace, uh, should control the money, um, should dole out monopolies as favors to uh, favored interest groups. That, that's where 
liber liberalism really started to form in opposition to economic control like that. This was just a historical reality that was damaging to people's lives. And absolutism centered around censorship, controlling free speech, controlling trade, so there was no more free trade. And if you look at the early liberals, it's all about uh, ending the jailing of people who were criticizing the regime. It is about not throwing people in jail for trying to import foreign goods. That's all really the core of the ideology, and it comes from that very specific time. It's about hating the regime and its economic controls. That's where the core of it is. And uh, coming out in favor of modern day social democracy and stuff really has nothing to do with that. And so calling that liberalism is nonsense. So what can you do? I mean, how do we take back the term? I mean, first of all, stop using the term liberal the way leftists want you to. Look, they still have plenty, there's plenty of terms you can use for those people, progressives, social democrats, just leftist uh, commies, if you want, whatever. Plenty of terms. You don't have to give them liberalism also, which they stole from the free market people because they knew that ideology was popular. Those people, by the way, also in the mid 20th century, they tried to steal individualism too, uh, to mean basically a left wing agenda. So don't, don't let them do that either, although they, they don't, they don't, they're not nearly as uh, successful with stealing that term. Uh, so yeah, stop giving them that term, stop using it, uh, and maybe just, just really use it the way it historically was used. Um, even if it might confuse some people, you can always clarify uh, what you mean by that. But there is no difference between this idea that people are thinking of in terms of historical liberalism and modern day libertarianism. It's the same thing. There's not a real distinction there, even though we're going to uh, continue to see uh, big differences there and all sorts of nonsense is going to be attributed to that particular ideology. Uh, but history matters. The place that places came from matters. Understanding um, how people have regarded terms historically matter. And if we're going to talk about the history of the world, we need a term that accurately describes different things in different times and places. If liberalism means both social democracy and mild socialism, but it also means hardcore laissez-faire as it did in 1810, well, then the term has become useless. So uh, the use of words matters. If we found out in recent years, as the left has redefined a variety of terms such as vaccine uh, or phrases like sexual preference to mean whatever it is that the left thinks it means at any given time, uh, just handing over terms to the left constantly, uh, it's uh, stop doing it. We, we should stop immediately. Uh, and with that, we better wrap up this episode here of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, Tho, uh, for uh, joining in and for uh, always keeping tabs on what's going on in the, the modern world, which I don't uh, pay quite as much attention to. And uh, we'll be back next week with more from Radio Rothbard, so we'll see you next time.